All right, thank you everyone for joining us in person or over Zoom. It's my pleasure today to welcome Professor Fadl Adib to give our seminar for today. Uh, Fadl is an associate professor in the MIT Media Lab and the Department of Electric Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, where he leads the Signal Kinetics Group. His, his lab works on developing wireless and sensor technologies for perceiving, sensing, and communicating or interconnecting the physical world with applications in climate, health, robotics, and smart environments. In addition to leading his group, Father is also the founder and the CEO of Cartesian Systems, where they develop technologies to map indoor environments with applications to uh, address a lot of the challenges in supply chain logistics and uh, and networking in, in inside the factories. Um, Father's success is is mirrored by the amount of awards that he got, and just to name a few, Father is a MIT Tech Review 35 and the 35 awardee. He's also a Stone Research Fellow for our D, and most importantly, an ACM Sigma Bill uh, Rockstar Award. But it's a pleasure to have you here. And anyway, I'm, I'm sure we're all excited to hear more about your work. Take it on. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for joining in person and over Zoom. Very happy to be here with you today and share with you the research that my group is working on. Our research is motivated by a desire to decode hidden worlds. Um, in many ways, this is my personal motivation for research. I want to be able to see or sense things that are otherwise out of reach, difficult to sense or to connect with or to perceive. And we develop technologies that allow us to decode hidden worlds uh, and enabling new applications in areas spanning oceans and climate, robotics, smart environments, health, and so on. The research that I want to discuss with you today is done by two of my teams, both my lab at MIT and the startup that um, spun out of my lab last year. And I want to tell you how in both of these, uh, what we do is we develop new technologies for sensing the physical world in unconventional ways. And we have three main approaches to do this. A, we develop new technologies for battery-less sensors. We also develop new technologies that allow us to do perception using wireless signals. And finally, we combine these technologies together in robotics to enable new capabilities and tasks that were not possible before. And the goal of developing these technologies is to address a bunch of challenges and problems ranging from oceans and climate to health, ecology, um, as well as indoor logistics, drones, um, and augmented reality. What I hope to do in today's talk is to give you a flavor of the research that we're doing, why we do it, the types of technologies that we develop, and how we take these technologies and deploy them to solve real world problems uh, in these domains. I wanna start by asking a question. What plays the largest role in the world's climate? Is it carbon dioxide or transportation or food production? Actually, what plays the largest role in the world's climate is the ocean. It determines our weather, it mediates our entire climate system, and it is also the part of the world that has been most impacted by climate change. In fact, over the past two decades, the ocean has absorbed more than 90% of the excess heat content that we've emitted into the atmosphere. The ocean today also holds more than 93% of CO2 that is on the planet. Now, with the ocean playing such a big role in climate and being impacted by climate change, we might ask, how much of the ocean have we measured? Let me ask this question in a different way. What percentage of the ocean has never been observed? Over 95%. And this is a big problem because it means that our climate models are missing data from over 95% of the ocean. And it also means that we do not know in what ways climate change is impacting over 95% of the ocean. So a few years ago, uh, my group and I started thinking about how we can address this problem. And coming from a networking and sensing background, our idea was that we wanted to build an internet of things to observe the underwater world. So we wanted to take sensors, deploy them at scale in the ocean, and use them to measure the ocean um, and observe. And as we try to do that, as we try to take sensors and deploy them, we faced a problem. And the problem was that the battery life of underwater sensors is extremely limited. When we dug deeper into this problem, we realized that the main reason is that 
that these sensors need to transmit their data. To transmit their data, they rely on underwater modems. And even the lowest power underwater modems consume a few watts. And on top of that, they cannot be recharged easily. You know, if I have a smartphone or a smartwatch and it runs out of battery at the end of the day, I can simply plug it in. But if I have a sensor that is deployed in the ocean, imagine that I need to send a research vessel, pay fifty to $70,000 a day just to replace its battery and come back. And in fact, because of this, most state-of-the-art sensors for continuously tracking marine animals or monitoring the evolution of marine habitats can only last for a few hours or days if they're running continuously, after which their batteries die. And that makes it very difficult to use them for long-term observations. So to overcome this, what my group did is that we invented a technology that enables underwater bass scatter networking. This type of communication technology is so low power that it could run without any batteries by harvesting energy in underwater environments. Let me explain to you how our technology works by comparing it to how traditional underwater communications work. In these environments, you typically have, for example, a drone or a ship or a submarine or even an access point near the shore that wants to communicate with a large number of sensors. Now, for simplicity, let's say that I just have one temperature sensor. To send this data, you cannot use things like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth underwater because they rely on radio signals which lie exponentially fast in water. Instead, you use sound. So the sensor has a speaker or what is called a projector. The underwater drone has a hydrophone. The sensor, it encodes its data using sound and it sends it using acoustic signals. Now, remember that the problem is by transmitting using sound, I'm going to drain my sensor's battery. So instead using our technology, both the speaker and the hydrophone or the underwater microphone are on the drone. And my sensor instead has an acoustic reflector, which you can think of as a mirror. So when the speaker sends sound, it reflects off this reflector and it comes back to the receiver. Now, in order to encode information, all my sensor needs to do is to switch its reflector, for example, between reflective and non-reflective states. Once I can switch between two states, then I can transmit bits of zero and one. And because I can encode any sensor data in binary, I can communicate simply by modulating the reflections of an external transmitter. So in comparison to existing technologies where the sensor generates its own acoustic signal and that drains its battery, Using our technology, the sensor communicates by reflecting an external acoustic signal, which can be done at extremely low power. Now, you might be wondering, what did you do? You just shifted all the power consumption from the sensor to the drone. And the answer is yes, but that's exactly what I want to do. Because the drone has its own power source, and now I can scale this to a large number of sensors that are deployed in the ocean and use this to make them extremely low power. Now, all of this is great, but there's still a question which is how do we control the reflections of acoustic signals? Our idea to control the reflections of acoustic signals was to use piezoelectric, um, piezoelectricity or piezoelectric materials. For those of you who are not familiar, piezoelectric materials can transform mechanical energy into electrical energy. So let me give an example. Let us say that you have a piezoelectric material and you try to measure the voltage across its terminals. And let us say that you have a speaker that sends sound. Sound travels as a pressure wave. It causes the piezoelectric material to vibrate. And because of the vibration, you get an electrical signal. So it transforms mechanical energy, which is sound, to an electrical signal, which is the voltage. And this is how piezoelectric materials operate. But remember, what I want to do is to transform this into a reflector. So all I do is I need to add a switch across the terminals of the material. When the switch is open, the material behaves freely, transforming sound into an electrical signal. Now let us see what happens when the switch is closed. When the switch is closed, it means that the two terminals of the material are connected to each other. And when they're connected to each other, they, you, cannot have, you do not have any voltage. And so the material cannot vibrate. So you have an incoming energy and the material cannot vibrate, where does this energy go? It has to be reflected back. So by simply closing and opening a switch, we're able to turn the material from an absorber into a reflector. 
We call this piezoacoustic backscatter because it uses the piezoelectric effect in order for it to backscatter or reflect back sound. And what we've shown is that piezoelectric backscatter needs a million times less power than state-of-the-art low power underwater, underwater motors. Not only that, in the absorptive state or non-reflective states, it can also absorb sound. And so it can harvest energy in the non-reflective state, and that allows us to make it entirely battery-free. Yes? A question come through on Zoom, which what happened if a whale was nearby? That's a great question. You backscatter the whale's sound. It's In fact, it's even better if there is an external source of sound because now you can backscatter it. But where do you lose that uh, information bit? Because you are not supposed to send an atom. In what sense? When the whale is singing? Yeah. So No, because you can backscatter the sound and you have a receiver that is getting both the whale's sound and they're getting the back the backscatter reflected signals. You can actually see the changes in the modulation, and you can decouple them from each other. So, the nice thing about backscatter is if there's an external exciter, you're even better off. So long as your receiver is actually hearing the external exciter. If your receiver is hearing your backscatter, it's going to hear your external because the it's losing the signal that is being lost is more on the backscatter than it is on the because of the triangle inequality. Okay. Right. Just for a, so yeah. what happened if I have a network of like 10? Yes, I'll get to that a little bit. In a little bit. Okay, I have a few more people on. So let me, um, okay. I think uh, there's a few things that I might answer, and then I'll get back to, to some of these questions to see um, if they said. So I want to show you one of the first experiments that we ran in a large experimental pool on MIT's campus. At the far end of, of the pool, there's the projector speaker and there's a hydrophone receiver. Here's our batteryless node. It's connected to the circuit. The circuit has an LED. Now, as I play the video, remember that it's a batteryless sensor, but the LED lights up because it is able to harvest energy. And it also backscatters, so it communicates signals back. So I want to show you the signal that is received by the hydrophone at the far end of the pool. Over here, I plot the normalized amplitude as a function of time. And this is the signal that we get back. At around two and a half seconds, the projector or the speaker starts transmitting. So you see that it jumped in the received signal. And at around three seconds, you see the signal start changing between two states. This is because the node is on and it starts backscattering. So you're seeing the changes in the reflections that are coming out. And over the past few years, we've developed different algorithms and techniques to scale with many nodes and deal with other reflections in the environment. I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, this is one of our uh, first nodes that we built. Uh, we fabricated and 3D printed the transducers. The earliest, sometimes I get a question, okay, you're reflecting, how do you know in which direction you should reflect back? And our earliest designs were omnidirectional, which means that, remember that the reflector is is an analogy. It's actually what we're modulating is what is called the sonar cross section. And so you can actually reflect in all the directions. More recently, what we've done is we've developed these retro directive reflectors such that, irrespective of where the signal is coming from, you're able to backscatter um, in the same direction. Um, we also built the hardware for energy harvesting, bidirectional communication, both on the downlink and the backscatter on the uplink, and uh, integrated different types of sensors. The other thing is that this whole node costs about $100. And if you're familiar with ocean acoustic research, this is like pennies for them because they cost ten, tens of thousands of dollars. And it consumes extremely low power. And over the past few years, we've developed it in different ways. For example, uh, we developed different node designs. Um, here you could see, uh, for example, we developed them to be ultra wideband. Why do we want them to be wideband? So that they can backscatter, for example, whale songs as opposed to just uh, the signal that's being transmitted. Um, but a specific signal. Retro, retro reflective nodes, that's what I was just talking about, um, where we show that you could um, reflect back in the direction that the signal came from. Um, we've also developed the, com the fundamental communication theory and methods. I'll talk about that in a little bit. We extended it to MIMO, full duplex, MAC layer, modulation, uh, link budget analysis, and so on. We also uh, are using it for localization. So similar to how Wi-Fi and Bluetooth does not work underwater, GPS also does not work underwater. And so it's very difficult to do underwater localization. And what we've been doing is using our batteryless nodes as a batteryless underwater GPS that you could use uh, for localization. 
We've also been developing tiny ML models and deploying them on our sensors, uh, on our nodes for different types of sensing, and also developing mechanisms that allow us to do um, underwater imaging using our uh, using and communication using our um, technology. I don't have time to go into all of these. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of things that I think are extremely important. The first one is um, we developed this technology. We, pu our, we published our first paper in around 2019. And one of the questions that we had was, what is the realistic range of underwater backscatter? The reason why this is important is now you're suffering from path loss twice on the downlink and then again on the uplink. And so to what extent does this really limit us from our ability to be able to scale up? And also, how do different design parameters impact this range? So um, what we uh, developed also last year is that we derived the end-to-end -end link budget analysis. So uh, starting from the transmission that we're getting all the way to the, um, to the electronics, we considered as a function of the input power, what the path loss that you're getting, what are, what are the losses that you're getting because of electromechanical conversion and electrical electrical impedance mismatch. And we computed all the way, both the energy that gets harvested and also the SNR uh, at the uplink. So we derived these, the end-to-end -end analytical or theoretic, theoretical model. We also simulated it and then we put it to test. So we took, um, we took the, uh, our, um, uh, our system and we wanted to verify to what extent our theory matches in practice. And what we showed in our experimental evaluation um, in underwater environments is that the theory matches what we're getting in practice within 0 0.5 dB, which is extremely important because now it means that we can model extremely well uh, the range and the design parameters that impact underwater backscattering. What we also showed is through using this, we then develop different kinds of simulations and showed that the theoretical model shows that it can extend to kilometer scale distances under the proper design parameters. And these design parameters are even for commercial applications, not speaking about Navy sonars, which can transmit at much higher paths. Why is this important? This is important for two reasons. First, it can enable many applications that we originally envisioned for underwater backscatter, especially in coastal monitoring or offshore aquaculture. Aquaculture is seafood farming. It's the world's fastest growing uh, uh, food sector, where you can start monitoring, for example, aquaculture farms using these sensors for uh, habitat monitoring in the coast and so on. The other reason is that more than half the ocean is less than a kilometer deep. So this means that if you deploy these at the bottom um, of the ocean, then a research vessel that is traveling at the surface can ping these sensors and it can extract information from them with about 50% coverage. Yeah. I have a question about the choice of frequencies. Is there a reason you were focusing on the 10, 30 kilohertz versus a much lower hertz where actually you can propagate over hundreds of kilometers? So our model is is generic uh, in terms of you can apply it irrespective of the frequencies and we've, we've tried it at different uh, frequency ranges. The main reason is that a lot of the applications that we were focused on were more commercial. Uh, Navy sonars actually can go to like three kilohertz or even or 900 hertz. The problem is that the, the transducers become much larger because the size of the transducer is basically uh, directly related to the um, or to the wavelength. Uh, but in principle, you can also apply it there and then you're right, you will get even further ranges um, uh, with lower frequencies. Matt? Yeah, so Bill just partly anticipated me. The, the coast is a very noisy place uh, because the spectrum is used a lot by all sorts of life forms that are roughly the scale of that transducer. It, is there a good frequency band that, that uh, doesn't compete? It doesn't matter. I mean, it's standard interference, like similar to how we have. There's two ways of thinking about it. A, I want to try to identify a frequency that has low noise and transmit there. And there is so many mechanisms that you could do in dynamic, in dynamic like spectrum search to try to search for those. But the flip side is it really does not matter because we've been running, for example, experiments in the Charles River, which is way noisier, for example, even than a harbor. And what happens, what ends up happening there is if there's another frequency, you're going to backscatter that frequency as well. And as long as you can get both of these frequencies at the same time, then you're able to, uh, to extract the backscatter signal itself. There's multiple ways of doing that. 
One way is you have two hydrophones and then you do some form of MIMO zero forcing at the receiver. Another way that you could do it is you actually still get the signal and you're able to get the, the fundamental and then the backscatter is, is gonna backscatter at a different frequency band. So you can filter that out, extract the information that you want and then go to the, uh, to the other band and work with that as well. So there's many different tools that you could use that are relatively mature in the communications literature and apply them in this problem domain. Okay, good. And, and following up, uh, is is there a mode where you can not just harvest but pump energy into the and signal to the sensor to to send a stream? You can if you don't want to try to harvest. It's a it's a good question because what the link budget analysis tells you is: Am I limited, for example, on the downlink harvesting, or am I limited by uh, by the round trip path? And what's interesting is that you end up being more limited by the downlink than the round trip. In which scenario, what you can do is you can add a small battery. For example, the simplest thing is you can add a small battery and uh, it becomes not batteryless, but this battery can last for decades. You stop being limited by the energy consumption altogether because the power consumption is so low. Um, the other thing that you could do is you could harvest energy from other sources, like from underwater currents, or even we've been working with folks at, um, at San Diego to harvest energy from soil. These are called microbial fuel cells. And you can harvest even watts of energy um, from there. And so that allows you to also operate them uh, for a long time. Okay, cool. We have one more question. So we'll take one more question and then continue. Yeah. Thank you. Hello? 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 Audible. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I got a question. Uh, the KGB actually played with something similar back in the 60s and 70s. Basically, they had a resonant structure that intentionally distorted under changing temperature, pressure, or sound. That was the entire sensor. You queried the sensor by sending a wave or a set of waves at it, typically in the microwave band. And then you listen for when the backscatter increases, that you hit resonance. So this gives you this gave them essentially co continuous readout, no battery, in fact, no electro active electronics at all. Uh, it was just a tin can with a membrane and uh, very carefully cut and trimmed slots on that tin can. So uh, it was actually before the 60s that that happened. What you're referring to is what is called the Great Seal Bug. After the end of World War II, uh, the Soviets gifted the Americans what is called a great seal bug. Uh, and that's just like a brass uh, seal that they put in the US embassy in Moscow. And the Americans were very happy with it. But what it actually turned out is that this was a listening device. Because what happened is that the uh, device itself vibrates with any sound and using a microwave signal from outside they're able to send the signal and they're able to snoop on it and it wasn't That's exactly it yes and the americans did not even figure that out it was a british amateur radio uh, uh sort of uh, engineer who was tuning the radio and he started listening to what sounded like something that is a is a conversation that is um potentially classified um, so this is um, the original concept of backscatter, and backscatter in microwaves is actually a well-known concept. Um, uh, for example, RFIDs, which is the number one, which is the most popular uh, IoT device, by if you want to consider an IoT device, uses backscatter. The challenge was how do you bring backscatter to an underwater environment, and this is what we did with piezoacoustic backscatter. That's one part of it. The other thing is actually analog backscatter is good, but it's not great. Like what you're describing of not having electronics, it's fine, but then it becomes really difficult if you want to multiplex, if you want to apply things like medium access control, or you want to be able to encode some data in different ways, it becomes entirely instantaneous. And so there's a classical um, distinction between analog and digital backscatter from a, like a theoretical perspective and application domain perspective. And in most environments, you actually do want digital backscatter rather than uh, rather than just having it instantaneous and animal. Sorry, Patrick, can I ask one more question? Okay. Um, are you assuming here, uh, how important is it for uh, 
this device to be your uh, your only reflection. It doesn't matter. You're getting reflections from everything in the environment. Right. But this is trying to send a message. This is trying to send a message. So you have a code on top of the message. Everything is a in a code. Basically, like some sort of it's not just a preamble. It's also a code. Like think of it as a CDMA code. Oh, so you are basically one. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you can deal with like multiple nodes at the same time. It also allows you to boost your SNR because you're doing like some form of pulse compression. Um, yeah. Good. Okay, great. Um, another uh, thing that we did is we used this technology to build the world's first battery free underwater wireless camera. Uh, as I mentioned, Underwater observations is extremely important. Underwater cameras consume a lot of power because of the cameras themselves, but also because of the communication. Uh, so we built an end to end um, system that is able to image in underwater environments. I want to show you a quick video of the system. Uh, so here to the uh, right, you could see the underwater measurement setup with the camera and a multicolor flash and it's imaging a coral. As I play the video, you'll notice a few things. You'll notice that the, there's flash of different colors. And the reason is that the lowest power uh, seam, um, image sensors that are already on the market are monochromatic. And so we developed a mechanism that uses different flash colors and combining them in order for us to reconstruct uh, these images. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is that the image is being reconstructed in chunks, and this is because of the memory and compute limitations, but more importantly, because of the bandwidth limitations of the acoustic underwater channel. You saw this was played at 40 times uh, the speed that we did the reconstruction at. Um, I want to show you also a few images. This is of an African starfish. My students took out our camera to one of the lakes in New Hampshire, and they imaged um, pollution in the wild. Um, this here is a pretty remarkable result. What we did is we took the seeds of an underwater plant, we planted it, and we observed its growth over multiple days. And the reason this result is remarkable goes back to how I started by motivating that today it's really difficult to do long-term observations because you're worried about running out of batteries. But now because you're able to run at extremely low power or even batteryless, you can run this uh, imaging and wireless transmission for a long period of time. What about the power for the... Oh, the whole camera? Yeah. Um, the, you could build it such that, I mean, the entire thing, even the flash, because the flash was a low power LED, it was, um, you could harvest it, you could harvest enough power, but that was back in, that was in late 2022 when we published this. And our most recent thing, in our most recent uh, iteration, which is currently under submission, um, we developed a trinocular lensing system based on the original design, but one that is 21 times faster and 37 times lower power. And I don't have time to go over all of it. It can also even do 3D reconstruction uh, so depth imaging uh, underwater at even lower power. One of the main things that we did is that we actually eliminated the uh, flashing altogether. And the idea is actually simple, but also pretty elegant and powerful. So we, instead of one camera, we use three cameras at the same time. And then we uh, put R, G, and B filters on um, each of the lenses. Now, it ends up being a non-trivial problem to actually combine these because unlike RGB cameras where sort of you have one photodiode that is capturing one color and another one that is capturing another color, you're trying to also match between the different uh, cameras, even though they're actually the features that they're capturing are different because of the different colors. Um, and as I mentioned, we've been building on this um, in various ways over the past few years. Um, for example, uh, we're using the underwater GPS lower localization capability to enable underwater navigation, um, robotic navigation using uh, these nodes. Um, we're building on this to enable large scale networks and swarms. Um, we're developing even lower power designs, including analog underwater bass cover for the first time, but also how do you develop low power wake up if you're gonna add a battery to these. And there's many other applications in advanced imaging, joint sensing and communication, edge, edge machine learning, edge AI. And we're also transitioning this to practice with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, where we actually do a lot of our deployments and testing um, because there's many applications, as you can imagine. Uh, we've run tens of thousands of experiments over the past few years. This is two of my students, Osby and Jose, um, where they're extracting one of the nodes that, has temp that is collecting temperature and pressure measurements. 
And so all of this started with the goal of building an Internet of Things to decode the hidden underwater world um, with climate applications. But there's many other applications, uh, including scientific discovery, being able to uh, discover new species. Um, I talked about aquaculture uh, or seafood farming. Um, and there's many applications in exploration. One of the other areas we're really excited about is um, in extraterrestrial exploration. So scientists discovered subsurface oceans in Saturn's moon Enceladus and Jupiter's moon Europa. And as you can imagine over there, once you send the sensor, it's even more difficult to go and replace its battery. So we're working with NASA to incorporate our uh, technologies as part of their future space missions so that we can use them for long-term monitoring and searching for um, traces of life in these extraterrestrial oceans. Um, this project is actually super interdisciplinary from uh, uh, electronics to communications to computing. And so we've released all our code and data sets um, and tutorials. Um, and researchers around the world have been taking, for example, different parts of our project um, and building on it uh, for, uh, for enabling low power um, underwater sensing and communication. So I've been talking just about the ocean. Are there any questions before I move on to the other parts of my talk? No. Okay, great. Um, the second area that we work on is um, decoding hidden world in the context of robotics. And we've been amazed at the advances that computer vision has given robotics over the past few years, uh, how they can perceive and reason about the environments. Um, but we've been interested on whether we can enable robots to perceive things that are otherwise invisible to the human eye. For example, what is inside a closed box? Or is the food and medicine inside a closed bottle, say? Um, or can a robot fetch items and do manipulation, even if it cannot see these items? And the way we've been answering all of these questions is by augmenting robots with wireless perception. Unlike visible light, radio frequency or RF signals can traverse occlusions, and they reflect off also objects in the environments. And so they enable us to extend perception beyond line of sight. And we've been doing this um, in different phases over the past few years. Let me show you one of the example applications. For example, over here, there's antennas that are mounted on the robot gripper, and the robot wants to be able to pick up a, a key that is hidden under the pipe. The robot has a camera. Uh, or an eye in hand, but the camera's line of sight is blocked. So if you look from the field of view of the camera, it cannot see the item. Uh, but the robot can move around using its antenna to locate the keys, declutter, remove what is on top of it, and then uh, pick it up. And this can work in different environments. For example, over here, the robot is searching for a remote control that is hidden under the playa. And so it finds uh, where the remote control is, and then it declutters. Again, it removes what is on top of it. Even though it does not see it, it knows that it is there. So it keeps removing things until it, it finds it, and then it, it picks it up. So a reflector in the back of the room. So I'll talk a little bit more what this is and where this started and where we're going. Hands it to my PhD student that she watches her favorite TV show. <laughs> So the way we've been doing this actually is by leveraging the most pervasive IoT device, uh, which I talked about shortly before, and that it is using battery-free RFIDs. Today, there's more than 30 billion um, RFIDs deployed worldwide on clothing. Most of clothing is already tagged with RFIDs, uh, medicine and drugs, automotive parts, and so on. So the way it works is that we use this two cent of the shelf RFID, they come in different forms. Many of them are basically like stickers. They can be smaller, they can be a little bit larger. And um, each, uh, each RFID is unique. It has a unique 128-bit identifier that allows you to... So you transmit a signal, the RFID powers up, and it responds with this identifier. So you're able to know that the RFID is there because it responds with this identifier. And what we showed is that you can measure the time of flight on batteryless RFID tags. So how do we measure time of flight on batteryless RFID tags? Typically, time of flight estimation requires, uh, for those of you who are familiar, you might know that it requires specialized ultra-wide band uh, hardware. The wide bandwidth gives you enough uh, frequencies so that you can estimate the time of flight extremely accurately. And 
Unfortunately, RFIDs, on the other hand, are very narrow bandwidth. And so that is why traditionally it was thought not possible to estimate the time of life on off the shelf RFIDs. So what we did is we introduced a new excitation approach that can emulate ultra wide bands on off the shelf paths. And in doing so, it can bring our ability to do time of life estimation to the tens of billions of UHF RFIDs that are already deployed. So I want to explain how our uh, dual frequency excitation works, again, by comparing it to traditional RFID communication. In traditional RFID communication, you have a UHF RFID tag. A reader transmits a UHF frequency. The RFID harvests energy from it, and then it powers up. And once it powers up, it backscatters. So it modulates the carrier wave, or it changes how it is reflecting the carrier wave. Now, you might be wondering, why don't I just transmit an ultra-wideband signal and then measure the, the modulation? The reason is, if I do so, the RFID is not going to power up. It's not, it's not going to be able to harvest enough energy. It does not have the protocol, and so on. So instead, what we did, the problem is that, and as I mentioned, the problem is that the narrow bandwidth, which is around 20 megahertz, even if you consider the entire ISM band, is not enough to estimate the time of life. Instead, what we did is rather than just transmitting the UHF, we transmit two frequencies at the same time, both a UHF signal and an ultra wideband signal. What the UHF signal that has the command does is that the RFID is going to harvest energy from it, and then it's going to power up, and it's going to start backscattering. And because of that, it's not just going to modulate the UHF frequency. Now it's going to modulate both of the frequencies at the same time. And this is really nice because by combining the UHF and the ultra wideband at the receiver, I can use the backscatter that I'm decoding also as a code to extract the UWB modulation. And that allows me to estimate the time of flight on, uh, on the time. And so using the wide bandwidth, we can now estimate the time of flight. And that allows us to achieve accurate centimeter scale localization. So now that I can measure the time, it takes the signal to travel. I can map the time to distance. Because I can map the time to distance, then I fuse it with computer vision. And by fusing it with computer vision, I can narrow the area that I need to search for in the environment. So you start having a bunch of uh, potential locations. Then it moves around, collects a few more measurements. And then once it's done collecting measurements, it knows where the item is. And then it goes ahead, um, removes what is on top of it, and then it picks it up. So you use that. And, and then there's one last step where it can also verify that it has picked up the right item because it is able to locate it to within its. That is like collaboration or trimatical position. It's a little bit of trilateration, but it's also a little bit more. The reason is to some extent it's trilateration. But in reality, trilateration means that you only need three measurements. What happens is even though you estimate the time of flight, you estimate it to some extent modulo a few wavelengths. So it is not enough for you to do trilateration. You still have some ambiguity. And so you combine the vision and the RF to allow, that, to allow you to narrow in very quickly on, on the item's location. In fact, it ends up being, um, from a robotics perspective, a next best view problem. Because on one hand, you need to account for the wireless dilution of precision, which basically is the further apart I get my measurements, then the more accurate my location is because I'm going to be able to estimate them more accurately. But on the other hand, the further apart I move, the displacement becomes longer, so the robot becomes uh, less efficient. And so what we did is we formulated this as a reinforcement learning problem on RF and vision, and showed that by solving this problem, we're training and then testing in reality, we're able to achieve high success rate in locating and picking up items in line of sight non-line of sight, and also fully recruited settings. Now, you might be wondering, what if the target item is untagged? Or what if I have some target item and the tag fell off of it? Can I still locate the items that I'm looking for, even if there's some other items that have RF ideas to them? And what we did is we developed probabilistic sensor fusion that allow us to reason about the environment. 
Let me quickly show you another video. So over here, there's a target item, which is this uh, stuffed animal, pink stuffed animal, which is not tagged and not visible. The robot knows how this item looks like, but let's say it does not have a tag. And there's a bunch of other RFID tagged items in the environment. And as I play the video, the robot will immediately know where the item is, and then it goes and it picks it up. So how did the robot know where the item is, even though the item is not tagged? The reason is the robot is able to locate, or at least have a hint of where all the other RFID tagged items are. And it realized that they are over here. By combining that with computer vision, this means that the item that I'm looking for is unlikely to be able to fit here given all the other items that are already fitting here. And so it knows where it needs to go ahead and search uh, for the other items in the file. And what we've shown is that an approach that is like this outperforms a vision-based system by about two times in terms of um, how fast it can uh, find the items, even if a single RFID is present in the environment. Of course, this depends on the complexity of the file. And the reason is that a vision-based system is just going to keep searching while we're able to reason in a much better way by locating items uh, that are otherwise hidden. So how do you identify that item if the item is Come again. How does it identify that particular item? So the reason it identifies it is it knows what it is looking for. And then it locates where all the other items are. And then it creates a probabilistic map of the environment. So let us say that imagine you have a pile and part of the and I don't see the item that I'm looking for. Part of the pile is hidden and a bunch of the pile is hidden. And the question is, where should I go and look in the pile? Now, let me say I know what, what my item is. I try to search. If, if I use only computer vision and reason about the environment, it could be anywhere that it's hidden. But let us say that I now located the RFID tagged items, and there's the other RFID tagged items that are occupying this part of the pile, and I do not see them. Then I know that most likely my item is in this area that is not occupied with the other items that are in the environment that I already located using RFID. Yes. We have a question online, Matt, yeah. if you want to go ahead. Is, is the time of flight in any way sensitive to objects that might cause multipath or oh, yes, yes, RFID absolutely. tags that you don't know about? Uh, RFID tags that you don't know about? Uh, yes to both. You can fix, you, we address both. So for RFID tags that you don't know about, it's not a problem. The RFID protocol queries everything in the environment. You know what you have, you know what you don't have. You can select the item that you want and only it will respond. That's the standard RFID protocol. It's already at, it's already there. So you're only getting uh, the RFID that you have. But of course you're getting multipath from other items in the environment. And that's exactly why you need a wide bandwidth. Because if there was no, if there was no other items in the environment, you can simply use uh, like simple phase estimation methods and they allow you to compute uh, or to estimate the, dif the distance. But because there's other reflectors, you're gonna, because there's multipath, the signal is gonna reflect off this multipath and come back. And by doing ultra wide band, band estimation, you're able to estimate each of the paths that come back. And then you know that only the earliest path that is modulated is the one that corresponds to your RFID's location. Good answer. It's a real problem, <laughs> so good, okay. Um, Recently, we've also been working, been, been looking at uh, millimeter wave uh, or next generation RFID tags. So the U UHF tags are around 900 megahertz. Millimeter wave tags are emerging. They have, um, you can locate things with even higher accuracy and so on. And one of the things that we've been using them for is uh, to develop drones that can navigate in the dark by using these um, RFIDs, millimeter wave RFIDs as anchors and I say 5G, 6G because these tags are expected to be part of either 5G or 6G. I wanna just quickly show a video here of, uh, of the system. So there's a drone we mount, uh, and, and over here there's also our tag that is in the environment. The drone has um, millimeter wave radars that are mounted on it. And uh, this is the tag, it's a retro reflective tag. Um, and the drone uses these tags in order to self-localize. Um, so, here, 
uh, in the bottom left, you see the 2D of the environment, and we're comparing MyFly, which is our system, to the ground truth. The ground truth, we obtain it from OptiTrack. And you can see that um, our uh, accuracy in being able to reconstruct is actually fairly close to the ground truth. Interestingly, the ground truth stops registering here because we put we didn't put enough markers on the um, on the drone. But of course, wireless can go uh, like it's not impacted by. You don't need a large number of markers to be able to do that. And we also showed that something like this. I mean, the way it's working is it trans the radar transmits signals and then it gets the the modulated reflections from the uh, millimeter wave tag, and it uses them to estimate the 60 poles by also fusing it with the IMU data um, that is on the drone. We also showed that this works very well in the dark, so even if you cover the drone's um, cameras or in comparison to VIO, it would still uh, work very well because, of course, RF signals do not require um, light, and so this is why you could use something like this to um, to localize and navigate in the dark. It's actually a pretty interesting problem domain because um, like how do you do the, the millimeter wave tracking? One of the things that we've been looking at now is we started with localization. We're now moving to navigation. And we're also interested in RF visual sensor fusion to enable, OK, if you have low lighting, but maybe like what if suddenly you start having more features? How do you combine the best of both worlds between RF and vision um, in these environments? And so with this, I've also told you about uh, what we've been doing in the context of decoding hidden world with robotics. I'll come back to robotics a little bit towards the end with one of our newest projects, but are there any questions about um, this before I move on to another area? Okay. So a third area that we, we've been working on is um, decoding hidden worlds with augmented reality. And the idea is to be able to give humans X-ray vision, to allow them to find and retrieve hidden items, similar to how we allowed the robot to find and retrieve um, hidden items. Um, the basic idea that we wanted to do is, in principle, very similar to what we just described before using the robot, but actually taking these and putting them on uh, an augmented reality headset poses a number of new challenges from the fact that I cannot take a huge antenna uh, like I put on the robot and put it on the headset. We needed to develop antennas that are conformal and that do not uh, do not occlude any of the sensors. We also needed these antennas to be sufficiently wideband so that you can still estimate the time of flight. And we need to, rather than instructing the person to move on a predefined pattern, leverage natural human movements. So I'll play a short video, um, which is narrated in the voice of my PhD student, Macy. This new invention combines wireless signals with computer vision to find items that are hidden from view and guides the user towards the desired items for retrieval. This new invention, dubbed XAR, relies on a new, flexible, conformal antenna. The researchers designed this antenna to fit on the Microsoft HoloLens without blocking any of its cameras and sensors. The system leverages RFID tags that are batteryless, cheap, and already deployed on billions of items, such as apparel, consumer products, and inventory items. First, the user can choose the item that they would like to find in the inventory. For example, a specific t-shirt. In order to find hidden items, XAR sends wireless signals that power up the RFID tags in the environment. The tags then respond back with their unique identifier, even when they are inside boxes or behind other objects. XAR creates a virtual 3D map of the environment. As the user walks, XAR tracks the headset's trajectory and combines it with RF measurements to estimate the location of the RFID tag in the environment. XAR opportunistically leverages the natural human motion to collect measurements from various locations and narrow in on the position of the requested item. When XAR is confident of the location of the item, it is visualized on the AR glasses as a holographic globe for the user. XAR uses the hand tracking technology of the HoloLens and combines the RF measurements with the trajectory of the user's hands to verify if the correct item is indeed picked up by the user. This technology has many industrial and retail applications. 
I'll skip a little bit over the applications. Uh, there's many applications in retail, supply chain, and so on. I'll talk a little bit about them when I talk about tech transfer in a bit. Um, as I mentioned, there's many interesting problems that we had to deal with from how do you design the antenna to how you develop the localization algorithms to how do you do like higher level reasoning, such as picking verification. One of the interesting ones was um, actually the, the localization, how we were doing localization. Um, one of the techniques to do localization is to do uh, synthetic aperture radar. And uh, the basic idea of synthetic aperture radar is if you have an RFID tag and you have an antenna, the antenna is mounted on the headset. As the person moves, you, you transmit a signal, you get its reflection, and you're able to create sort of a heat map of its location in the environment. Remember, we're able to also estimate time of flight to some extent. And you can also combine these measurements co coherently if you have things that are moving on, uh, as if you have an antenna array, but it's actually a bunch of antennas that are moving in time. And uh, synthetic aperture radar, you can also apply it across uh, frequencies and you can combine them. Uh, and that's actually what we've, uh, what we've done in, in addition to uh, estimating the time of flight before. Um, the problem is that you can instruct a robot to move on a specific uh, direction at a constant speed. But natural human movement cannot be done at a specific, at a constant speed or in a, in a very well-defined direction. And it's actually a big problem because let us say that a person is walking on some path, which is almost in a certain direction, and you assume you just approximate it as if it were at a, at a constant direction and speed. If you were to do that and you were to try to apply, apply the synthetic aperture radar SAR equations, you get a mess. So why is this the case? Why does it look so different? Like, why did I just get a blob here? And the reason is we're manipulating phases. In RF, a really a small change in phase based on distance completely can throw you off completely. And what happens is that the inaccurate estimate of the antenna locations can cause large errors in the, in the SAR localization. So to be able to to locate the tags while leveraging natural human motion, the idea that we had is we realized that the headsets themselves have internal tracking. And so what we started doing is we're exploiting the AR headset sensors to track the human movement. And all we needed to do is to figure out the transformation between the antenna's location on the visor and uh, the headset. Once you figure out this location, which is which ends up being some geometric transformation, then you can feed that into your SAR formulation, and that allows you to apply uh, the SAR equations and get extremely high location accuracy in being able to localize the items to within less than 10 centimeters, which basically means they are able to locate the items uh, to the right object. Um, last year, uh, my lab spun out uh, Cartesian systems uh, to commercialize our research on AI-based artificial sensor fusion. And what we want to do, what we've been doing, is deploying, is leveraging already deployed RFIDs to enable high-resolution mapping and localization in indoor environments, starting with retail stores. So, what are some of the applications of this? Let us say that uh, you walk into, you're a shopper, and you walk into a store. Uh, this is actually from a real deployment that we have. You're searching for an item. For example, if you're searching here for a routine in uh, the custom in the retailer's app. And then it can tell them, oh, okay, it's in that zone uh, of the store. So now the user knows in what zone of the store the item that they're looking for is, and they can go to that zone. And once they're in there, uh, they're able to, uh, they, they look around and they can find it. Um, you could also help it help a lot with the internal operations of the store. So most in-store operations, actually any retail store is about the labor that is invested in moving things between the stock room and the sales floor, the dressing room and the sales floor, the sales floor and the stock room, um, items that came that they need to be put somewhere and so on. And it's actually a very time consuming process. So for here, what the retail associate is doing is that it, he's using it to figure out where this item should go. So for example, he goes, he scans uh, the barcode, and then he's able to tell, oh, it's on T1, C1, which is their indication of this is in zone one, furniture one, or like rack one. And so he takes it and he knows where he needs to put it back um, in the store. Uh, and that makes their operations uh, much more efficient. 
how is that using RFID? So what we've done is we're using an off-the-shelf uh, reader. Uh, this is that's already in the store. Um, he selects the floor that he wants to scan, and it, what he does is then uh, once he selects the floor, he starts scanning. So we create this. This is an app that we built. To the um, to the right of the app, uh, to the right you could see a map that we're able to extract in uh, in the environment. The map shows the different uh, furniture. So, for example, here you could see the rack, uh, the table, and so on. So, any piece of furniture that has not been scanned before is uh, red, and when it is scanned, it turns from red uh, to green. So, this is a way of giving them feedback. As he's moving around, we're collecting data from computer vision and RF, and we're combining this data in order for us to localize all the items. We get this data and um, we send it to their servers, and that's how they're able to extract this information and know uh, and expose it in their app to where the items are. Currently, our accuracy in mapping items to furniture is about uh, 98%. Um, this was also, uh, we piloted it last year for uh, over a month. Um, they scanned over one and a half million SKUs. We got a lot of their locations um, and we uploaded them. Um, what's, what I found to be very interesting in taking this research and, and transitioning it to the, to the real world is that there's a lot of exciting technical problems that we're coming across from like 3D reconstruction, visual localization, segmentation, or a visual sensor fusion. And having been in academia for a long time, I didn't realize that the problems could be so interesting. And one of the other things that is super fun about it is that I know I'm solving a problem and I know this problem is going to have a direct impact on my product on my customer, on the shoppers, and so on. So it ends up being an intellectually interesting problem that I know is going to be useful and is going to be useful very soon. Sorry, question over here. Yeah. The device that the person is carrying, uh, how is that localizing itself in the, in the store? It uses a combination of computer vision and RF. So we actually, a lot of our pipelines are RF visual sensor fusion because you need that location to be very accurate and if they're not accurate they're going to start giving us calls saying this thing is making errors and it's putting me in this other part of the store. Like for RF basically you need is it using Wi-Fi or? No it could use RFID. Specialized, uh... No we actually use one of the things that we've also done is even though we build as you saw a lot of hardware we use off the shelf hardware so a lot of it is in the algorithm with the RFIDs that are already there. And there's many applications. I talked about some of the applications in, uh, in uh, retail stores. There's many applications for indoor asset tracking and operations and navigation in retail, warehouses, manufacturing, and so on. And this big problem of indoor positioning, indoor asset tracking, indoor navigation, this is not a solved problem. And so it's also a very exciting space to be operating in um, as a startup. We're on time, by the way, but I can. There's still one other part that I want to uh, talk about. Um, should we take questions or should I continue? I think there's about five more minutes. Can I talk about Wi Fi? Yeah. I'm going to be talking about the some of our seeing through walls work. I won't talk in a lot of details, but I also want to talk about what we're doing as a next stage in it now in my lab. Just like there was a question about this. Uh, can you put it down? Okay. okay, so let me continue. Um, smart environments. Um, the main question is, is can we local map and localize the environment without any tags at all? And um, this dates back to actually my uh, master's thesis at MIT, where I wanted to be able to use wireless signals like Wi-Fi to see through walls and track people without any sensors and any tags. And the basic idea is that when you have a wireless device and it sends a signal in the environment, the signal reflects off the person's body and comes back. Uh, and what we do is we build intelligence into this device so that it can extract these signals and analyze them and sense people without any body contact. And what is really cool about RF, as we were talking, or uh, sub-10 gear signals, is that they can also operate through occlusions like walls, and that allows us to sense and see people through walls. One of, uh, the early, this is one of the earliest systems that we built. Um, in, uh, the device is in another room behind the wall. In the bottom left corner, you see the upward screen of the device. Notice the red dot on the screen because it tells you where the device thinks the person is. And the spiral on the ground is only there to show you the level of accuracy. As I play the video, you'll see that the device tracks the person very accurately, and it does so without any sensors on their body. 
by relying entirely on wireless uh, signals reflected off of their body. And because you're using wireless reflections, not only can you track um, people's locations, you can also track uh, their gestures or their limb movements. And in doing so, you can allow them to control appliances just by pointing at them. So for example, over here, my collaborator Zach is pointing at, for example, the TV to turn it off. And of course, uh, if you leave a room and forget to turn off the lights, all you need to do is to point in the direction of that room. And we're doing all of this using a device that is on the other side of the wall in the adjacent room. Uh, we uh, also originally we were tracking people who are moving. Many of us here are sitting and static. And a natural next question for us is how do you stack the uh, track people even if they are um, sitting down or not moving? And we realized not only can you locate people, but you can even measure their breathing. So for example, over here, a grad student version of me is sitting down. The device sends wireless signals and measures its reflections. And to the left, you can see the output of the device. And what we're able to see is uh, we can track the inhale and exhale motion. And these are like the peaks and valleys. So for example, when um, uh, the user holds their breath, you stop seeing these large variations. And the reason is that when they hold their breath, they stop impacting as much the wireless signals in the environment. And when they will release their breath in a bit, you will start seeing these variations happening again because they were able to monitor um, their chest movements. Uh, one of my favorite applications at the time was a baby monitor. Uh, so what we did, uh, this is actually the output video of a baby monitor. If you look in the top left, you see that time is passing. But when you look at it, all you see is a still image. And what we did is we took this baby monitor and we augmented it with the output of our device. And um, when we did that, we started being able to get the baby's breathing. Um, so uh, for example, here you could see the inhale and exhale motion. You could also see the baby's heart rate, which was 126 uh, beats per minute. This is actually typical for an infant that is this age. And here the device was on the other side of the wall and was tracking the breathing and heart rate through the wall. So um, this was based on my PhD research. Uh, at the time when President Obama was president, we were invited to the White House and we demoed um, this research to him. Um, there's many interesting anecdotes from the demo that we did one of them is that I was, um, if you actually go and look at the video, you'll see that my friend Zach puts his, the video is available online, he puts his hand on his mouth and he starts laughing. And the reason is I was the subject of the demo and the device was tracking my breathing and heart rate and the president could see that my heart rate was 110 <laughs> as I was doing the demo. Uh, this led to, in, the, in computer science, the rise of a modern subfield that focuses on wireless sensing, where we've shown that you could get people's locations, gesture, breathing, heart rate, emotion, stress levels, in practical indoor environments by relying entirely on wireless signals reflected off their bodies. Uh, we launched a startup that is currently using the technology to monitor thousands of patients and monitor disease progressions, accelerating clinical trials in patients ranging from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, COVID-19, and so on. And it's also already had commercial impact. It's um, influenced the uh, uh, Wi-Fi task force. Uh, it's core to 6G discussions, and it's also influenced many products that are already on the market. Uh, whose patents reference our papers and patents uh, for wireless sensing. And by the way, over here, are you using the actual waveform when you're uh, identifying the, let's say, heart rate, breathing rate, and so on, or you're using only channel state information from what I said? Like, well, how, what level of information are you using? There? We've done different things. Originally, we actually only started with CSI. Eventually, we started building our own hardware. So we're, we're creating the waveform. But over the past few years, like this has exploded. There's people who use Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LoRa, um, like any kind of signal that you use. And many, and sometimes they use just CSI from one antenna, from multiple antennas, doing channel bonding. It's become a pretty, like the, the field has grown a lot uh, since we originally started. Originally we were just Wi-Fi CSI. And the original question is, can you sense people on the other side of the wall? Uh, but this has become a huge like uh, subfield now. Yeah. Uh, Tim, do you want to go ahead? Let me just, uh, there's okay. one more thing. One more. Um, and so there's literally one slide. From tracking moving humans to non-line of sight perception of static objects. Uh, so 
And this is really a convergence of the two areas that I talked about, both in the context of robotics for like piece picking robots, where a robot wants to understand what is inside closed boxes, and also the research that I was just talking about in terms of being able to sensing with sensing humans without any tasks. There's many applications, a lot of them are in warehousing and logistics and um, and robotics and so on. So how can the robot see what's inside closed boxes with the caveat that it's also not moving? One of the things that really helps us with people is that they move. So it becomes very easy to sparsify the environment simply by doing some form of background subtraction that allows us to focus on the subset of reflections that are moving. But here you can't just do that anymore because the items are static. And so what we've been doing is we've been leveraging low cost millimeter wave hardware to see through occlusions. I wanna show you a few examples. This is still unpublished work. So how we're imaging, so for example, a um, uh, a chain or like metallic objects or even non-metallic objects like everyday objects. Uh, what we did is, for example, we took the YCB data set, uh, which is used a lot in the robotics community. And what we created is um, the first millimeter wave uh, data set that is also multi-spectral. Uh, so here are the images, for example, that we're able to see. These are images that we're able to reconstruct through occlusions. Of course, computer vision would not be able to see these. And now what we're working on is we're developing um, a millimeter wave data set, uh, simulations and vision models to enable non-line of sight perception from classification, segmentation, and reasoning. And it's really exciting because um, you, sometimes you take a computer vision model and it works on these millimeter wave images. Sometimes you take it and it does not work. So it's a very rich um, area. But what we are missing is if you want to enable the type of advances that happened in computer vision in non line of sight perception, we also need to start by creating uh, the proper metrics and data sets and benchmarks. And so this is um, very recent work. It's still under submission. Uh, but we're pretty excited about moving in this direction and doing millimeter wave based uh, perception. And so with this, I've told you about our research on decoding hidden worlds with areas uh, ranging from ocean, robotics, augmented reality, smart environments. Um, I told you some of the motivations that what, what drives us to do these, some of the real world applications, and um, why we're excited about this. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. We should let Tim go first. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yeah, that was a very cool talk. Um, I, for the smart environments for this Wi-Fi uh, sensing, can you handle multiple people at once doing multiple, you know, m both moving or uh, or is it really yes, one? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can do many. And is that uh, what matters? What matters is like the distance between them, and even if there's two people that are hugging in bed, you can dis disambiguate their breathing now. Hmm. Yeah. That's ominous. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, Matt, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Um, so the seeing through boxes are the boxes are they're partially transparent to millimeter wave, or or they, they are, are structured. They are wave. transparent to millimeter waves. You they are, are right. Completely yes. Transparent. Okay. All right. Uh, so, in in what sense is this not computer vision just moved into another frequency band? There's many reasons. A, because you're actually, millimeter wave images do not, so there's two parts. Actually, it was a good question. Millimeter wave images are not exactly like computer vision. I mean, look at the third image over here of the Windex model, right? Mm -hmm. You see, if you see the other one in computer vision, it's very easy to segment. It's very easy to recognize, but in, once you start looking at RF, it actually is not very easy to segment and it's not easy to recognize. Um, there's very interesting problems. For example, an apple uh, looks very different than, like looks in some ways similar to an orange in some other ways not similar to an orange. The types of reflections that you get there, this is what's super interesting from like an intellectual perspective is that the reflections depend on, a lot of what is different ends up depending on specularity. You don't generate these signals. I mean, these are, remember, uh, phase array-based signals. So there's complex domain signals that you make from them, try to make from them images by interpreting them. But in reality, the type of specularity that you get in vision, optical, is very different from the specularity properties in RF. 
And the reason is because of the significant difference in, uh, in the wavelength. If you look at the same image, but in a different millimeter wave band, it will look different. But what is transparent in one millimeter wave band is, ends up being uh, significantly, for example, attenuated in another band. So how do you also combine these different spectra using the off the shelf, like uh, hardware that has been commoditized now so that you can still do these tasks of like perception and recognition and segmentation, which are generally otherwise easy if you use computer vision. I, yes. I see. So you, you're saying essentially that the, the reflectivity and transparency problems are more highly varied as you vary the frequency? They, they are very, they're different. That's the thing. They are just like what you consider to be specular. A mirror is like many things are mirrors and many things are not mirrors in aura. And in fact, what is interesting is that we also do not understand the properties. Like we don't know how you should manipulate, how you should always manipulate these signals to try to recognize what is going on. Okay, but uh, I, I guess what I want to know is, is, is your contention that from a mathematical modeling perspective, this, this is a fundamentally different problem or just that the the empirical appearances in these frequency bands is going to be more different than what we'd anticipate having. It depends on it, it depends on how you want to the abstraction layer that you want to operate in. From a physics perspective, it is fundamentally different. If you now go to the CS like abstraction, it is also different because the input that you are getting is different. And so the question is, how do you operate across these layers to develop the proper models that allow you to reason about the environment by exploiting both the low, your understanding of the low level physical properties that are there, but also using the existing models that exist in the literature, for example, for computer vision, how can you adapt them given these and how much do you need to know domain knowledge? So the answer is a lot of this is still open, more about open questions than answers. And that's why I think it's very exciting, mm -hmm. but it's going to be both both at the, the mathematical level, how you're going to be modeling, but also at um, the perception level, how are you going to be able to reason about this at an abstract level? Fair enough. So I just quick question sure. about that. Um, it looks like you know, you're using a pretty wide aperture to see, to visualize these, uh, these objects over here. Uh, so I would assume that you're actually going by art it is moving around. That's correct. Yeah, it's just one single snapshot. It's not a single snapshot. No, you're doing synthetic aperture radar, and actually you're doing FMCW and synthetic aperture radar and combining them to be able to get these. And you're doing that at, at all different frequencies at the same time, and you're collecting the RGB data as well. So that's why, I mean, you could actually then decide then maybe I want to sparsify this. Like, what if I take a smaller number of these? Is that going to be enough? Um, I think my question related to that, like to create the data set, do one have the standard like uh, field of view, like depths, because the cross range resolution is kind of like, uh, related to the to the depths, right? So if the, but you you can fix that if you know the what the depth you can discover the depth you can fix that using the point spread function. Yeah, just for the data set for view, like you you sort of look at it like const like single depths. And you have the image on that. Yes. Okay. So yeah. 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 And you collect it in line of sight and in non line of sight. Okay. 